culture is the real product that founders build. Every organization has a culture. You can either be deliberate about it or it can be a series of accidents. Yeah. New people join, they right. things, stuff happens and yeah. culture gets created. Where people in US are still not realizing the potential of what India can do. And uh, I think it's, it's a lost opportunity for them. One of my OKRs in life is hopefully 10 people from companies that I start, they work there and they start 10 unicorns. Now we have six months of cash left. Now we have five months of cash left. And that was not causing people to panic or leave. It yep. was creating a sense of, boss, we need to make something work. Yep. People say, why are they not starting a company? Like, I don't have a good idea. Yeah. And a uh, good idea is not going to come <laughs> if you're waiting for it. It's right. going to come and hit you from, yeah. you know, behind you. You want to do a startup, you have to have an irrational desire to build something. Yeah. Because it is irrational. Hello, I am Mukesh Bansal. Welcome to Sparks. Our guest today is Ajit Singh. Ajit is a twice unicorn founder. He is also a close friend, someone I went to college with. It has been incredible to watch his journey. He started Nutanix, which was one of the biggest tech IPO on Nasdaq in 2016. His second company, ThoughtSpot, is now worth over $4 billion. Ajit is a very product-centric leader who obsesses about getting the product right. In this episode, we'll discuss what it takes to build a very strong foundation that results in a unique culture, which becomes a strong advantage for the company in the long run. Ajit shares his thought process about building highly differentiated products, how to get the fundamentals right. Uh, he traces the rise of SaaS and why India is poised to play a very big role in the emergence of SaaS. The best practices that Ajit shares is relevant to any entrepreneur, especially entrepreneurs in the SaaS space. There is so much to learn from his journey so far. I hope you really enjoy this episode. Ajit, thrilled to have you here. Thanks for having me. Your first uh, company that you built in Silicon Valley, Newton X, uh, went public. It's currently worth over $6 billion. Your second company you started, ThoughtSpot, I think raised money at over $4 billion. And I'm pretty sure IPO is probably on the way. You may not want to talk about it today, but two companies worth four and six billion dollars already. And every time I talk to you, you're bursting with entrepreneurial energy. Like, how have you sustained this energy for the last 15 years? And you know, how you think about uh, building companies, your future, what do you want to do? You know, just let's start there. Yeah, so I'd say um, I've been extremely fortunate to be part of teams that have built these uh, companies. And uh, there are uh, maybe a couple of things that uh, give me energy. One is, I've always enjoyed um, building things from scratch. So this joy of creating something out of nothing um, is, is really core to my source of energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the second thing that gives me energy is just people. Mm -hmm. I've been very uh, picky about people that I work with, and that includes um, co-founders, investors, uh, team members. Um, I really think that if you uh, go after big goals with good people that have a similar mindset of building and solving problems in an open environment. Uh, there is there is infinite energy uh, inside people, and then this comes out when you are working with good people. That's very humble of you, Hajit. I think there are not many people in the world who have built two companies back to back worth you know multi billion dollars and probably very good future ahead of them. I think other day you know, I was meeting you, and then after this, you know. I introduced you to a common friend, Sanjay, who you know, was uh, from Bloom, Bloom Ventures, and uh, he remarked that, you know, what a humble down to earth guy, you know, doesn't look like he's built, you know, those massive companies. And I think it comes right off the bat. But let's, you know, I never, you know, even though we went to college together and I've known you for all these years, I can don't know where, where you grew up in, what was your growing up years like in India? Yeah, so um, I uh, come from a family my, of uh, farmers, actually. My grandparents were farmers uh, in UP, Western UP. Uh, my dad um, was a research scientist. Mm -hmm. So I grew up uh, all over uh, UP. And um, uh, some of the things that uh, I think had a big impact in shaping me on uh, uh, who I am uh, was early days, uh, my dad was a research scientist and he would take me to his lab. And we would do simple things like titration. And I would get so excited by mixing two things that change color. Which area uh, of research? He was um, working with Department of Agriculture, um, and uh, he was a chemistry uh, mm -hmm. and agriculture chemist. Um, and uh, in that, uh, going to his labs was, I think it left a very deep impression. Mm -hmm. I'm very young, probably 
seven or eight years old at the time. Um, so I, I grew up all over uh, UP and then um, we went to Kanpur together mm-hmm. um, for undergrad. I did my uh, master's uh, MBA from Calcutta. Mm-hmm. Uh, came to work in Bangalore actually for six years mm-hmm. and then uh, went to the US. Which part of Western UP? I'm, I'm also from Western UP, Haridwar. So. Yeah, Muzaffarnagar. Muzaffarnagar, yeah. right, right, yeah. That's where uh, my grandparents were from. Right. Amazing. And it's, uh, I didn't know that you know, your father was a research scientist in agriculture and doing all these chemistry experiments. No wonder you end up, you know, doing your engineering in chemical engineering and you were, you know... No, I don't think that had, that <laughs> is the best uh, I could get with my rank. I was not smart enough like you to go into uh, computer science. Uh, you so made I, the most of uh, the, you know, but, uh, your degree. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, I was, will not doubt my grades, but I know you topped, you know, your, your uh, uh, department. Okay. So, you... Um, you said, you know, you were working in Bangalore for six years. Do you recall like how those, you know, first uh, 10 years before you founded Nutanix, what kind of things you used to think at that time? Did you have entrepreneurial aspirations? You know, did you think at some point I'm preparing more to start a company or how did, you know, those, you know, your 20s went back? You know, I had never imagined that um, I would um, end up doing a business because as I shared, uh, my family is farmers, um, engineers, scientists, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, my brother, elder brother, he was the first engineer in the family. So never thought about that. But uh, that uh, interest in just putting things together mm-hmm. and creating something new was always there. Okay. So early uh, part of my career, um, out of the MBA school, I actually went to um, management consulting, but mm-hmm. I hated it, <laughs> did it for one year because I felt I'm just producing PowerPoints and telling others how to run a business uh, when I'm just out of school and I have no experience uh, of anything. So I, I left that very quickly and then uh, came to Bangalore to join a company called IQ Technology. Mm-hmm. That was in uh, supply chain planning software. And I think uh, I2 was one of the highest concentration of really smart people that I've mm-hmm. never worked with. Yeah. I learned so much. Uh, they kept me on my toes. Um, and uh, you build this sort of um, uh, benchmark for excellence. Mm-hmm. If you uh, have the opportunity yeah. to uh, work in a high quality en- environment. Mm-hmm. So when I now try to recruit people, yeah. I always look for have they been inside a high-quality environment? Mm. It doesn't matter what role they played, whether they were senior, junior, this was their first job, last job, whatever. Mm-hmm. But once you've seen excellence, uh, it it sort of sets a mm-hmm. sets a bar for you for the rest of your life. So I did that. And then um, after three years uh, uh, at I2, I went to join Honeywell, which is a very traditional company. Mm-hmm. But there was a very interesting opportunity to uh, build uh, something new. I had the good fortune of working with a VP of Marketing and Product Management uh, who was based in U.S. Hackney. He was uh, part of the aerospace business. And uh, he wanted to bring, um, uh, I don't know if you heard of this OnStar um, technology that GM had built for remote monitoring of cars. Okay. So if you're driving a mm-hmm. car, all the sensors would send data right. and uh, OnStar would monitor the health mm-hmm. of the car. If you are into an accident, they can automatically call yeah. um, you know, medical help and so on. So. He wanted to uh, bring that sort of technology to uh, monitoring of business jet engines. Mm-hmm. Honeywell is the global leader right. in uh, that segment, uh, small jets mm-hmm. uh, engines. And uh, the way they were monitored was very sort of uh, manual. If you uh, bring a plane from Mumbai to Delhi mm-hmm. and, or maybe Mumbai to Banaras yeah. and something goes wrong, you will literally have to uh, send a technician with a laptop mm. and then they would connect the laptop to the engine controller, download all the data and then try to figure yeah. out what has happened. Yeah. But if you could, as soon as the plane lands, if you have a GSM antenna, mm. then you can transmit that data. Correct. And once you have all the data, you can basically monitor this mm-hmm. whole um, fleet of uh, right. that are flying around. Yeah. So that was the opportunity I went there and I learned so much mm. uh, at, at a place like Honeywell. I learned how to build something new, uh, a new business. Yeah. Um, I am. We work with IDEO, the design firm, yeah. um, for for uh, this, and uh, that exposed me to the world of uh, design thinking. Honeywell actually had a very good design team mm-hmm. as well, which was very unusual. This was 2003. We are right. talking about mm-hmm. way before yeah. Steve Jobs showed mm-hmm. people what can be done with yeah. design, iPhone, iPad. Now I think everyone has a much deeper appreciation for user mm-hmm. experience. Um, I was extremely fortunate and that also stayed uh, with me and has been a big part of how we thought about solving problems and building our products at uh, Nutanix and uh, uh, and Thoughtspot. Amazing. Amazing. So with Honeywell, actually, I went to the US yeah. and uh, once the the product we were building uh, was ready to launch, uh, then 
uh, we lost to the market and uh, I didn't want to uh, stay in a very large organization mm-hmm. for too long. And I really uh, wanted to get closer to technology. So I went to uh, Oracle in the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, and then um, as soon as I was in the Bay Area, I'm like, I can't be here and not uh, work <laughs> in startups because I have really enjoyed building new things. I joined a startup and then we started in time. Bay Area tends to do that to you. I tried to, I went there in 99, tried to start a company. I was all over the place. But, you know, just listening to your, um, you know, first uh, seven, eight years of, you know, work experience. So, first of all, I find another common ground, the mutual dislike of consulting companies. <laughs> I started my job with Deloitte Consulting, couldn't last there more than 18 months. But one thing you mentioned, I think, you know, that's a pretty deep insight that uh, looking into people's past background to if they have been to high performance environment. Because irrespective, I guess, even your contribution, the high performance environment shapes you in pretty significant manner, you know, the habits you pick up, right. your mental models you pick up, role models you pick up, right, and so on, that becomes part of that. So, and I think that's also learning for people who are early in their yep. career, yep. is where are you spending your time with, Correct. right? It, Correct. That's, it can be, it shouldn't be uh, that I want to go and work at this brand name company. Yeah. Uh, just find the best people that you can find yeah. and hang out with them. Right. doesn't matter what role you get, uh, what title you get, um, and best people capability wise, but also a positive one, man. Yeah, I'm also able to personally relate to it because, you know, after trying to build this company, which, you know, didn't go anywhere, I ended up working for four different startups. So basically I was, you know, working very closely with entrepreneurs and just watching them, you know, up close, seeing their method of working, seeing them also make a lot of mistakes and how they recover from that, sometimes not recover from that. But I, you know, absorbed a lot, you know, I don't know, somehow, you know, maybe my inability to pick right startups and most of them did not do well. And I was put in disillusion by the time 2007, 8, you know, when Mentor Journey started. But only in retrospect, I realized, have, you know, spending time with those, you know, quality entrepreneurs. Yeah. And the success and failure is not always in your control. Yeah. But what I learned from them, you know, came in really handy, you know, much later, you know, Third my career. Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, early part of your career, it should be all about um, maximizing learning uh, mm-hmm. and and um, getting to know good people. You build networks. There's just right. so much uh, goodness yeah. that comes out of it. You should talk about your uh, journey a little bit as well. Specifically, uh, I remember when I was uh, moving to the US, you were actually yeah. coming back right. at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you started Mintra in uh, 2007. Seven. 2007 seven, 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 seven seven is when right. I left. That's right. You came here. And you're still building things. Yeah. Where, where, what is your source of energy? Yeah, when is, I'm recalling, you know, I know you were leaving Bangalore and go to Bay Area. I think a classic case of, you know, for both of us, the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. You know, I thought... Actually, that... I never wanted to go, okay. to be honest. Right. Uh, okay. But my wife was interested in seeing the world. Right. So she said, why don't we go and try? Yeah. And spend a year. Right. And then I liked it there. Yeah. Then she wanted to come back. I right. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another, you know, common. You know, I also never wanted to come back to India. Yeah. Because I actually loved that, you know, the environment Silicon Valley. It's a great place, you know, and talk about, you know, high density of, you know, very high caliber people and so on. Yeah. But what happened for me in 2004 to 7, you know, we were setting up development centers in Bangalore. Mm-hmm. I just got carried away with the energy I was seeing. You know, it felt like, you know, India is really ready to take off. You know, that yeah. was the inspiration for that. And partly also now is for me, uh, the answer to your question has been 25 years. I've been around, you know, the process of trying to build a, you know, product or a company from scratch. I just love that process, you know, yeah. because that's so much uncertainty. Yeah. You don't know what the formula or method is. Yeah. But you keep at it and something start to happen. You know, right. that process seems, you know, very magical. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The degrees, I like to think of like degrees of freedom. They're right. so high. There's so many degrees of freedom. Yeah. And trying to move the things around in yeah. a way that makes sense. Right. Doing And doing it with people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when you're uh, coming up with ideas, somebody saying, you know, that is not good. How about we change it like this? And then... Yeah. It, it's really beautiful. Problem. Yeah. And other, you know, very interesting about being an entrepreneur is you cannot blame anyone else. You have to look yourself in the mirror because unlike in a large company environment, you may have a boss, there are corporate policies, yep. there's some, you know, here, who do you blame? You can't blame the customer that, right. you know, customer is not, you know, it's just ultimately. And that part of also, you know, just being fully in charge, your yep. have empowerment. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So just, just going back to you know, your, you know, uh, initial, you know, uh, welcome to New Tannix. What are some of the two or three, you know, key skills you think you were able to build deliberately or unconsciously, which came in, you know, very handy for you much later? Uh, um, while starting your time? Before you, you, you before work with Honeywell. Okay, what had I, I done? Right, huh? it, oh, like, I, do, you, sure. do you think there's some skills you end up building in that time period? Right, right. Because there's in some ways your apprenticeship period, you know, you were, you didn't knew at that time that you're going to be an yeah. entrepreneur, but you're still, you know, accumulating those skills. So, sure, sure. Yeah, so I talked about a few things already. It's curiosity about new things and uh, building new things was a passion. Uh, designers and a lot of these things are just a good set of accidents. It was not that you know I'm trying to program my career. Right. 
uh, in hindsight, it sounds like a nice story, but as we know, life is not like that. Um, um, so, uh, you know, design, building new stuff. Then before I started Nutanix, uh, I worked at a, a startup in the Bay Area, uh, Astro Data. It was one of the early big data companies. And that experience, it was a couple of years, but it was extremely good. Because what I realized was it was about 30 people when I joined. And even a company at that scale is a microcosm of a, a large company, of a business. And uh, when I was at Oracle, um, I, I spent nine months uh, at Oracle, um, um, Redwood Shores office. And um, there, maybe once in a month, I would talk to a customer. Maybe once in a month, I would talk to somebody from marketing. I was doing product management. Obviously, I hung out with engineers on a regular basis. Uh, but when I went to this startup, uh, everybody sat around me. You know, you're talking to head of sales five times in a day, and finance is happening there, HR is happening, product marketing is happening, product management, everything is there. You're um, uh, in board meetings, you're seeing how investors act in board meetings, what questions are asked. So you learn so much. I think the pace of learning is, is probably several orders of magnitude higher. Uh, and all of that came very, very handy. And um, the thing I've tried to do in my company is also uh, to run companies in a very transparent manner because we always want to hire people that are very entrepreneurial. And I, I like one of my OKRs in life is hopefully 10 people from uh, companies that I start, they work there and they start 10 unicorns. Um, so I try to run companies in a way that people come and do you know, what they want to do and they might be engineers or salespeople or marketing, but they should get a very holistic experience. Um, at ThoughtSpot, I used to run our board meetings as all hands meetings until we were about 110 people. So 110 people in the board meeting, you can imagine. And I had told my board that it is at some point when we, we were small, it was, it was okay, obviously, five, seven people, it's all good. But I told them that at some point it won't be functional and you will not be able to ask hard questions, uh, but that's okay. At that time, fine, we will change it. But until then, I wanted everyone in the company who's left great jobs to come and work there to have that full experience. It was so fun to see, uh, and even the presentations, when people come and present to the board, I always told my leaders that you should let the most junior person come and present uh, because it does so many things. A 25-year-old engineer coming and presenting to the board, they are so excited. In the evening, they're calling their dad and telling them that I presented to the board and dad is saying, wow, awesome, I had to wait till 50 to present to the board, you're doing it, it's a growth company. Uh, plus, it also creates a sense of transparency because sometimes I've seen in, in startups, there is a real truth. There is a version of the truth for the <laughs> team. There is the version of truth for uh, the board. I, I don't believe right. any of that. All good, bad, ugly should be uh, out and it should yeah. be out continuously so then there is no surprise and I think the level of trust that creates yeah. uh, with the team uh, with the board that they are never trying to then read between lines that's outstanding Ajit I'm so glad you're talking about it and I very deeply believe you know this whole principle of transparency I think the work I have done with you know and cure for this is one of the core tenets of the culture we've tried to build the way I like to articulate you know the information in the company belongs to everyone mm. because once you have the same information then first of all you feel empowered you know, you feel that you belong. Yep. It's, you know, your mental ownership of whatever good, bad and ugly right. that's happening in the company. It also gives you right information to make better decisions. Yep. So the quality of job everyone can do. And yep. biggest thing, you know, it's a you know huge antidote to politics. Right. Right. If all of us know same information, right. there are no closed door conversations, yep. there's yep. no siloed information, Other then, you know, you there's no information is power. People use yep. information and power, right? You know, who yep. knows who, who has access to what, yep. who knows what's going to happen, you know, but right. you just make it available. But you have taken one step further, you know, running board meeting 100 people is outstanding. You know, maybe, you know, if I ever get an opportunity to do, do something else from scratch, it's you know, I'll try to copy it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sure board members will love it also, right? Because they, they can absorb the energy. They know they're uh, listening to what is actually yeah. happening in the company. Right. And uh, early stage investors, they're, you know, growth, late stage people are looking at uh, more uh, uh, financial metrics and how the business is doing. Yeah. But people early stage, you know, they are fundamentally entrepreneurs. Right. They want to actually be part of building. Right. They want to see how this new marketing campaign that yeah. ran, it failed. Right. Why it failed? Now what are you doing about yeah. it? Right. So it's, it's really a win-win for everyone. Plus I also like to think of this, uh, when you're building an organization in a startup, you all, you all everybody has got their, their brain with ideas. Yeah. But you're also building a shared brain. Right. You know, it's all of yes. this power brain is connected to yeah. some with some uh, high bandwidth, yeah. low latency network. That way, uh, if everyone has the same context, yeah. there's a lot of uh, 
management overhead goes away. Right. Because you don't have to keep telling people Correct. about what to do, why we are yeah. doing certain things. It, it is. It yeah. is. I think I want to just double underline because I think, you know, a lot of early stage entrepreneurs will probably watch this. If they can, you know, grip, um, use this, you know, tool and just make information available to everyone. I think they'll end up building very different type of company. And I, I think there are companies which do this, but again, in India, I see a lot of companies which don't, you know, where their sense of, you know, founders know something, yep. senior leader know yep. something yep. else, you know, and so on. And that just, you know, will end up building very different company. It will look like both of us at least agree. I it's totally agree. And I think look. it's a good thing for the entrepreneur also, because otherwise, if you're trying to present this sort of game face in front of everyone, yeah. then you're keeping the stress of all the problems with you. Yeah. And there is going to be a little bit of fear of sharing. But right. once everyone knows all the problems, you will also be relieved. Right. And then you can actually focus team's energy yeah. on solving those problems. Right. As opposed to trying to manage optics. Yeah. And by the way, the employees, team members, they're very smart. Mm. If you're hiring smart people, even if you don't tell them, they will know something is wrong. Correct. And they will assume the worst. Yeah. It's better to tell them. Yeah. And they actually want to solve problems. Right. I've never found if we told the team that, hey, here is a problem uh, that uh, they... Uh, they might have uh, initially uh, some concerns, but then the next reaction is, okay, yeah. let's get together and solve. Right. That's how we are. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, initial trigger for this uh, came from a very first startup I work in Silicon Valley, Next Tag. This guy, Frank, you know, he was a CTO. And we used, in, in every all hands, he will come up on the stage and say, now we have six months of cash left. Uh -huh. Now we have five months of cash left. Right. And that was not causing people to panic or leave. Yep. It was creating a sense of, boss, we need to make something work. Yep. Like, I want to launch my product faster than, you know. Correct. And, you know, the whole company was able to rally behind that as opposed to they're trying to put on a game face and saying, you know, yep. we are good, we're going to next next round and all that, right? right. And I think right. that's, and then we'll probably come back later to, you know, the some of the best practice across Silicon Valley companies because it is a unique culture. A lot of entrepreneurial culture has evolved there over the last 30, 40 years. So we'll come back to that. Yeah. But I, I also, I hmm. think, for Indian entrepreneurs, I don't want them to think that this is very common in, in the Bay Area. It's not. I don't mm. think it is. There is uh, all kinds of companies right. everywhere. You can read in the press. Right. Um, so opportunities of doing good work and opportunities of doing, you know, think the wrong way. Yeah. They exist everywhere. No, great. And, uh, and maybe it's a good, good good thing to, you know, clarify, emphasize that, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, there are a few things to learn from Silicon Valley, yeah. but a lot of unique opportunities we have in India as well. Humans everywhere. There's no difference, actually. There's no difference at all. Absolutely. I, I actually agree with that. You know, I use that, you know, in the B2C context, when people talk about what is the difference between, you know, Indian consumers, US consumers, I really find no difference. Income level may be different, or they're used to certain products, so it's fundamentally human psychology right. and what people crave for, right? But okay. We park that. Let's come back to your startup. You know when, so Nutanix. How did the journey start? You know, was it a like knowing you? Was it a like slow, deliberate thing, or you know something clicked? You just jumped into it. Um. So, um, I think we first decided we'll do a company. Okay. And then we figured out what we are going to do. Right. So it was a, a deliberate, well thought out process, and um, um, I've always felt that not getting too carried away with your idea very early is mm -hmm. very important. Yeah. So both Nutanix and ThoughtSpot, we've been deliberate about um, picking the right market, then the right problem, and then the right yeah. idea. Um, I had I had a mentor in um, in the Valley. Um, this guy, uh, his name is Mark Leslie. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the founding CEO of Veritas, went it from 20 people to a really yeah. large company right. and, and so forth. He says, uh, he likes to say, I go very slow until I go very fast. Right. So that's sort of how I've tried to mm -hmm. operate, um, at least for very important uh, yeah. decisions. Right. You know, there's other things you can decide quickly. But uh, if you're uh, starting a company, um, changing the market is the hardest thing. Yeah. Changing the problem is a little bit less harder, but still hard. Changing idea, idea will evolve. Right. Like you have an idea, you'll have a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Um, you'll tweak, but um, both ThoughtSpot and Nutanix, we spent a bunch of time, I would say six to nine months, just mm -hmm. studying different markets yeah. and trying to figure out which markets have um, a lot of money being spent. Technology has become old. We will have, as a team, some unfair advantage yeah. uh, to solve problem. But we also learned a lot. Right. So the other thing we did when we started Nutanix was to um, identify some role model companies. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, uh, Data Domain, uh, Palo Alto Networks, these were yeah. uh, very successful companies in the enterprise infrastructure space. And we connected with the with the CEOs, people that, CMOs, CROs, uh, all of them mm -hmm. in those companies where we could hire, we hired from them. 
Yeah. We signed them up as advisors. They invested. Many mm-hmm. of them are investors in um, ThoughtSpot as well. Yeah. Uh, we learned a lot. Right. And uh, that um, explicit desire to identify absolutely the best people mm-hmm. and then uh, connecting with them and learning from them, uh, that was uh, a big part of being right. able to do whatever we were able to do. Mm-hmm. And I've found that uh, people that are uh, successful, they actually want to share. Mm-hmm. even And they're not looking for right. any return. Yeah. Uh, because they know that there are other people they who help them. them. Correct, correct, correct. Um, so that's another thing which um, I've found really good about uh, the valley, mm-hmm. and I see that happening. It's definitely uh, starting India to happen. You know, we have uh, some history of companies right, are exactly starting to become successful yeah, yeah. because, like, an ecosystem. Right, that's the absolutely. Ecosystem is a very, very right. important. Thing. I think the uh, you know the point you talked about um, that you first decided to start, and then over a period of time, you know, figure out what the idea is. I think we should talk more about that because a lot of people, you know, when have or who have entrepreneurial ambition, mm. they wait for the right idea to yeah, happen yeah, to them. Yeah, but yeah. what I have you know noticed is the, the way I look at it is, let's say I have a full time job and part time thinking about something that just you know one or two hour of bandwidth going into something. Mm-hmm. But if I start and now full time you know twelve hour fourteen hours a day I'm obsessing about that thing. Correct. So the the acceleration of you know the information that I have access to the people I'm talking to mm-hmm. and the quality of idea I'll come up six or nine months down the line. So that dilemma of, you know, you start and then figure out the idea later versus you have a great idea and then you quit your job, you know. What's your recommendation? How should people think about that? Yeah, I think this is the most common refrain I hear when people say, why are they not starting a company? Like, I don't have a good idea. Yeah. And a uh, good idea is not going to come <laughs> if you're waiting for it. It right. will come and hit you from, yeah. you know, behind you. <laughs> uh, you have to go and, and seek it. So I really believe in uh, if you want to do a company, do a company. Yeah. Um, the startup I was talking about, Astrodata, the, the co-founder and CTO, um, he was into skydiving. Yeah. And he used to talk about doing a startup like skydiving. Mm. And he said, when you go up, I, I, I have fear of heights, so I can never do skydiving. Uh, but um, he said, uh, when you uh, go up uh, with a trainer, uh, you're doing a tandem jump, and the trainer would tell you to look up and jump. Mm. Because if you look down, you'll never jump. <laughs> Startups are like that right. also. So if you want to do a startup, you have to have an irrational desire to build something. Yeah, because it is irrational. There is so much unknowns. Uh, that, you know, risk adjusted. Good people can work in large companies, make right. enough money, and have a good quality of life and everything. So you have to have right. uh, that desire. Uh, but if you do have, then don't wait for the idea because idea is actually that's the job. Yeah. You know, you don't start a right. company after you have an idea. Correct. Sometimes uh, I've seen people in their day jobs, they run into problems yeah. that they then want to go and turn it into a company, right. which is a perfectly fine way to actually mm-hmm. build companies. Many right. very successful companies have been right. built like that. Yeah. Uh, but that happens few and far between because if you limit yourself to what you have seen yeah. in the past, right. there'll be a very small set. If you're lucky, you'll find something, otherwise not. So if I can just build on that, right? So someone who really want to be an entrepreneur, probably they can you know, spend some time skill building and also creating some runway for them. Because once you start, you need to be at it for at least a few years because nothing is going to happen you know, before two, three, four years. And once you have that conviction, you start and then you know, immerse yourself very deeply. Mm-hmm. And most likely, you know, the world is you know, full of unsolved problems. Once you start looking, yeah. you'll find tons and tons of problems. There are challenges to which problem to work on as opposed to you know, when the ideas are literally... Dime a dozen, you know, at least I don't struggle to find ideas, yeah. but you have to look for it. Certainly, certainly, yeah. I think you have to um, identify things that you are passionate about, right. um, where uh, you can build a successful company. Yeah. Um, and if you upfront think about the market and problem, then um, you're building product, but then you also know that there is a fair chance that you'll get paid for right. it, so you can build a sustainable business. So if I, if my timelines are correct, you, know, you guys started in Nutanix, I think around 2007, 2008, 2009, 2009. so just after the financial you know, correct. crisis burst, I'm yeah. guessing funding wasn't easy to come by. Yeah. How were first you know couple of years like in terms of fundraising, you were able to attract good talent, and what was, you know, what was your pitch? It was not like, you know, you had big valuation currency, a lot of money to throw it. Right, right. How, Yes, yes. No, it was it was uh, interesting times for sure. Yeah. Right after uh, the 2008 meltdown, um, personally for me, uh, my son was born a second kid the same week that uh, we started in mm-hmm. So it was uh, crazy times. Um, but uh, all of us had this feeling that we have to go and try to build a company because once we had been in a startup, yeah. we see what it takes to build it. We felt we can do it as well. Um, that's another thing. If you work in startups, you know you get confidence about your own ability. 
Um, and uh, we had a friend um, who had recently become a VC, uh, mm. Bipul, uh, Bipul Sinai, he's actually doing rubric now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we knew him, so he, he uh, put in uh, a, a small uh, seed dollar, uh, seed amount. Yeah. Uh, we raised a million and a half dollars uh, in seed. Uh, Bloomberg Capital, they wrote a million dollar mm-hmm. uh, check, and uh, another, another half a million came from uh, their network. Uh, but after that, recruiting was hard work. Yeah. Uh, recruiting took a lot of energy. And I really believe whether you're a first-time entrepreneur or a 10th time entrepreneur, it doesn't really matter yeah. if you want to build really the most world-class team where people are really good at what they do, mm-hmm. they have a good attitude, and they're hungry. Yeah. It's going to take a lot of time. Right. So recruiting has been my passion. Uh, when I started ThoughtSpot, um, uh, I lived in Sunnyvale in, uh, in the Bay Area, and our office was in Redwood City, so Google office was on the way. Yeah. And uh, there's a Starbucks on Pier Avenue. I probably did close to 150 meetings in the first two years. Right. Coffee meeting. Yeah. Every day, literally, uh, up or down, I would be meeting people there. And uh, it, people say it's hard to uh, re- recruit good Google engineers. I, I uh, hope, but I recruited a bunch of... And I hope there was a scheduled meeting where you just, you know, walking into Starbucks or Google and just going... No, I don't and... think I've ever been that desperate. <laughs> it doesn't really work. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I did reach out to right. a lot of people very cold on LinkedIn. And they would respond and they would be up for meeting. And then you spend time uh, understanding um, who they are, what they're passionate about. Right. Uh, you're not offering them a job. Right. You're trying to uh, find, is there a true calling inside this person? Mm-hmm. And uh, is there a innate desire to do something different? Yeah. So you kind of find people in these big companies who uh, hate being in big organizations. Right. Well, it's a very successful company, mm-hmm. but at the same time, uh, there is so much money coming through ads yeah. and search right. uh, that uh, there is, it's very hard to do fundamental innovation right. because it could disrupt the business. Yeah. So you find those people that make right. high quality uh, but sort of disgruntled people yeah. and uh, they they make for great team. Right. But you have to work on recruiting. And part of you know building is on one hand, you know, as an early stage startup, you have to uh, convince people to join. You know, I'm guessing you are not paying the market salaries, you know, at least not in no, early not days. Not even close. Yeah, and people are taking 60, 70, 80 percent right. uh, haircut. And do you think that's also the right model, even for these days, you know, people are able to start a company with a sizable seed check also. But do you think it's a, also creates a different type of, you know, culture and dynamics? It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that creates the right selection bias. Yeah. You know, people that want to build, they mm-hmm. uh, come in. It doesn't matter how much money you have. If you're, I always feel that there is a lower bound and there is upper bound. Yeah. For you. The lower bound is if someone has to really think about their basic quality of life. Mm-hmm. If they are going to think about, should I take my family to a restaurant? Should I send my kid to this yeah. school? And uh, by coming to my company, yeah. I don't want to have. Right. I don't want them to go through. Yeah. That. Uh, but then, if you are uh, taking a lot of money, at least early stage, yeah. Um, um, as salary, that's not the best use because that salary could be used by somebody else, and your stock could go up. So, right. I think that's an area where um, it seems, from what I have seen here, Nutanix and, and ThoughtSpot both have substantial team. Right. Appreciation for uh, stock is a little bit less it's right. improving, and mm-hmm. we're not seeing better outcomes. Right. Um, in in India, but I think it is absolutely necessary because right. it creates the right alignment in right. the incentives yeah. for everyone. So, as part of you know developing startup ecosystem in India, I think both for the early stage entrepreneurs and people who want to work in early stage companies which are probably going to offer exponential uh, learning opportunities to really understand this aspect that you need to leave some money on the table now you go for ESOP ESOP come with their you know, equal risk reward equation yep. may not work out it works out it can work out really well I'm yep. pretty sure both Nutanix and ThoughtSpot you guys have created probably a huge number of millionaires uh, you know but that is that comes much much later in the yeah. game right you know just right. understanding and appreciating that on both sides will help create the right team structure and uh, right culture. But on the other side of, you know, you also have the, you have to evaluate the right people to bring in the company. And I think you're building a lot more deep tech company compared to, you know, what I have done. But from this pro engineering point, what is your mental model? What make, what convince you someone's going to be an outstanding engineer or engineering leader? Yeah. So outstanding engineer or engineer lead, engineering leader, um, is of course a function of uh, what you are building, yeah, and um, and the role that you you are hiring them for. There's a few things that I have tried to uh, use um, when I uh, look at talent. If I'm looking for leaders, I always want to give them an opportunity to do something more than what they have done. Mm. 
if I'm looking for a VP of marketing and if they've been VP of marketing three times, I'm probably not going to right. talk to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so giving people uh, an opportunity to grow is very, very important uh, because there is certain potential and skills they have. Yeah. And then what you offer them, what mm -hmm. platform, these three things go into sure. being, you know, the amazing performer yeah. that you want everyone on the team to be. Uh, now, how do you assess their um, skills and potential? Uh, Skill-wise, you can look at their background, and I have not built deep technical products as a hand-on engineer. So I always lean on my co-founders or other technical leaders in the team to do that. I've learned enough over time in both uh, Nutanix and Thoughtport going through all the design and architects, and I always enjoy learning. Mm -hmm. I've learned enough that I right. can have you know, pretty decent discussions there to get a sense for the complexity of problems that yeah. people have worked on. Um, but uh, I think that is fairly easy to assess. Technical skills are mm -hmm. easy to assess. From a potential point of view, you want to see have they been growing mm -hmm. in their job? Right. Have they been stuck in one place for too long? Yeah. It's sort of obvious thing. Right. Um, but uh, then uh, attitude is also very, very important. Right. So we always... Um, made it very easy for us to reject a candidate, even if they were really good, mm -hmm. um, but looked like I might have an attitude issue yeah. that will make for a low performance of the team. So looking at their performance. And did you guys something like, you know, as a, I mean, both the company worked on in the, at some stage, they started growing really fast, but uh, you and your other co-founders, you know, were you interviewing uh, at least one co-founder interviewing a person until a certain stage of the company? I think at some point you have to let go. Yeah. You have to let go of uh, ideas sometimes with a 500 people company and one co-founder has to meet mm. uh, if they can't meet. I don't think it right. scales that well mm -hmm. um, because you have to from day one think that the company is bigger than you. Right. Uh, as as long as you feel that you actually are going to add value yeah. by interviewing everyone, right. you should. Mm -hmm. In the early days, I actually used to play recruiter as well, meaning right. I wanted to make sure candidates have amazing experience. Mm -hmm. So I'd get the team together. We have five right. people, seven people. Tomorrow, there is a great candidate who's yeah. coming. Who's going to talk to them about what mm -hmm. you're going to focus on, data structures and right. other You're going to focus mm -hmm. on design and architecture. Yeah. You'll focus on interpersonal. I mean, general guidance, obviously, people can yeah. talk about whatever. But then as soon as one first person is done, right. the next person has to meet. And the feedback, yeah. all the experience right. is... is um, uh, is um, very important. So I spent a lot of time yeah. uh, doing all that. I think that answer you know, gives me a little bit of window also into you know why you've been able to create you know two amazing companies, perhaps a lot more in future as well. Um, the you know the idea of uh, companies bigger than you, because there is sometime it could be tendency as a founder I think I am the company or company something revolves around me, right? You know that. So you know that and second thing you know what you mentioned is. Uh, at some point, thinking, you know, can somebody else do this job better than me? The job may very well be shaping the company culture or driving recruitment and so on, right? So both of those are creating an environment where, you know, eventually company can acquire life of its own, which is not dependent on you. And that's in some way the founder of the best. So it frees you up also. Right. And that way you can keep doing different things. You can evolve as well. Right. If I am doing the same thing when I mean, there are five people or 500 people yeah. or 5,000 people, <laughs> How have I evolved right. as a leader right. or as a person? Yeah. I want to have fun as well. I want to learn new things. Right. I don't want to keep doing the same thing yeah. over and over. Right. right. So um, if you are not uh, letting uh, uh, new team members come in without talking to you because you don't trust others to be able to do yeah. that's bad. Right. But if you, there, are, I always told people, for example, like every other tech company, uh, we had diversity challenges too. And yeah. I wanted to bring diverse candidates. Mm -hmm. So I told recruiter, doesn't matter. Even if you were hiring. Um, say a woman engineer uh, from uh, from college they're the most junior people we hire and you need me to talk to them I'm available right. I'll talk to them yeah. when it comes to leadership I would want to make sure that you know we all uh, have an opportunity to meet with them but no I don't okay got it so early stage is you know hard I think in fact sometimes you know from outside it's very difficult to appreciate how hard it can get do you remember some like particularly hard moments or situation from your first you know couple of years at Nutanix yeah, look, I think uh, every state is hard. <laughs> if you think about Tim Cook today, right. yeah. <laughs> he's running one of the most admired companies. Right. But do you think he's not right. dealing with tons of problems? Yeah, he is. He definitely right. is. Uh, every business today mm -hmm. is disruptable. Yeah. Uh, I personally, I don't know, over time, I've uh, built a bit of a stoic um, uh, temperament. So I don't get too frazzled by right. 
you know, problem. I just look at problems as an opportunity to come together and solve something new. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, we've, of course, like any other startup, we've had uh, tons of issues, challenges, macro is crashing. We have to raise money. Will we be able to raise money? If we don't raise money or don't raise money on good valuation, employee morale will go down. Right. So you had the problem solving attitude is great. But did you also at some point, any moment, which was like, what am I doing here? You know, I would. Uh, I never no, no. No, I, I, I don't give up. I, right. I don't. Uh, and, uh, the other thing, uh, Mukesh, that has worked well for me is uh, being thoughtful before you get on the journey yeah. and um, being deliberate about, like I said, is the right market, right yeah. problem. That works well. Plus, if you have good people around yeah. you, then you don't feel that right. stress. Yeah. Because the desperation sets in. You feel like running away. Yeah. When you are sharing un- un- right. share of the burden. Right. Um, so if you're transparent and if you have strong people around you, yeah. then it becomes uh, just right. a problem solving exercise. And I think, yeah, and you're going to the heart of, you know, I think what problem is what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I think this also skill set applies to all walks of life, including, you know, people who might be working in larger companies. Every problem is an opportunity. And I think you are right that who does not face a problem, especially if you're trying to do anything ambitious or different or yeah, innovative, yeah, yeah. you are going to run into problems of yeah. one kind or other, right? But instead of, you know, think of the problem that you wish it was not there, almost welcoming the problem. No, that's the job. Yeah. I mean, that is the right. job. And when I recruit people, I tell them about all the problems. Right. I want to make sure they know everything. And I have this sort of simple test. Yeah. If I've recruited someone, mm. after 30 days of joining, I would ask them, right. would you still join? Right. And I... I really want that answer to be yes. Yeah. And when I'm recruiting them, I apply that test to right. this person feel. Yeah. So I tell them about the problems. I understand their motivations. Yeah. Uh, that's the job. That's right. how you create value. Yeah. The job is not to come into this environment when there's right. no problem. Yeah. Uh, but there is uh, what you're saying is right as well. Oftentimes, if people, uh, leaders don't share and they keep it to themselves, yeah. they fight a lonely battle. Yeah. It can get overwhelming. There are right. all kinds of uh, emotional st- issues, stress issues that you can read about, right. you know, go through. Yeah. I absolutely think it is not worth it. Right. Share it with everyone. You have a team for a good reason. Mm-hmm. You all succeed together or fail together. Right. Fail, you do it in a good way. Yeah. I can tell you there are so many entrepreneurs that I talk to right. that have failed, but they still have a great bond with their team. Yesterday yeah. only I was meeting with someone very young age. They did a bunch of stuff, very scrappy. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me that uh, we still meet every six months. Right. Uh, so I think then those relationships is what make life meaningful. Mm-hmm. As your Nutanix journey unfolded, at some stage, you know, relatively early, you decided to, you know, start again from scratch. Yeah. What, what you know, is this, like you came across a really interesting problem you could say no to or what was I, you know, what made you yeah, start? Sorry. Uh, Nutanix, uh, uh, functionally, I was running product management and marketing. Yeah. And the company was reaching a stage where we had lost the product, we had mm-hmm. started selling, we are doing well. I wanted to see if I can run a full company. Mm-hmm. So um, I talked to my co-founders and our investors and I said, I want to start a second one. Uh, and they were all very supportive. So it was basically, um, it happened with me and it happens with, I think, every entrepreneur with you as well. It's not like on day one you thought, I can be this entrepreneur right. and do this thing. Yeah. But you learn about your own uh, potential and ambition right. uh, over time. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been a progressive um, journey to learn more about myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, Valley is a place, and when I say Valley now, you know, tech industry, I yeah. would say the place where People are really willing to support you, to bet on you uh, continuously. Right. Um, that was basically the impetus. No, I didn't have an idea. Like I said, mm-hmm. actually, I first decided that I would do a company. Then I found a co-founder, Amit. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would uh, be in at uh, IT Kanpur a year after me. Yeah. And we spent a bunch of time thinking about all different areas. And we picked an area we were interested in. Right. And we built it. So Ajit, I've heard you talk about uh, shaping the culture in the organization, you know, deliberately. So in ThoughtSpot, you know, it's been a fairly long journey. What are some of the things, you know, deliberately done to create a culture of particular type? Yeah, sure. Culture is a topic that's very close to my heart and we could talk for an hour just about that. But uh, uh, look, I, um, every organization has a culture. Yeah. Any group of people uh, has a culture. You can either be deliberate about it or it can be a series of accidents. Yeah. You know, new people join, they do right. things, stuff happens, and yeah. culture gets created. Um, I believe in being very deliberate about uh, building a culture. And I, I really think that culture is the real product that founders build. Mm-hmm. You know, the other product and business gets built by the team. Um, of course, team has to be extremely involved in yeah. culture for the culture to scale and, um, and thrive. Um, but um, we've tried to be very deliberate in a few things we've done 
I think at Thoughtspot, six months into the company, we took the time to sort of define crisply mm-hmm. who we are. And oftentimes you'd see this very complicated, long corporate culture yeah. statements and all that. I We tried to keep it very simple. We use two words to describe the culture. Selfless excellence. So one, strive to be the best. Mm-hmm. Excellence means you want to be the best as a professional, yeah. what you do as a team. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that you'll be excellent at day one. Yeah, It shouldn't come with this sort of sense of you're pursuing excellence. Mm-hmm. You are not excellent on day one. You're making mistakes, you're learning. And all that is happening. But while you do that, you do it in a selfless manner. Yeah. Meaning um, you always put the team ahead of yourself. Right. In trying to be excellent yourself, you're not becoming excellent by pulling other people yeah. around you right. down. By playing politics mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So there is this sort of tension between these yeah. two words. And we use these two words to describe what the culture is. Uh, as a leader, you have to act mm-hmm. what you say. So that's yeah. rule number one. You can define the culture and, and put posters up, but if you don't act yeah. like that, then nobody is going to believe. You have to communicate very actively. Mm-hmm. Um, so small things, we created a, a channel, Selfless Excellence, where uh, you would see even today, um, people are recognizing others that are helping them mm-hmm. in so many ways. Right. People see others going um, um, beyond about um, their uh, job. Um, continuously, they're being recognized. Right. Um, you have to reward the culture. So, you know, these things are pretty common. You have a quarterly selfless excellence award um, in the company. Very importantly, you also have to uh, act when you see mm-hmm. violation of yeah. culture. If people are acting in a self- selfish manner, then you have to, first, you uh, have to talk to them and understand the yeah. context. Don't uh, assume the worst. But if you find uh, people that are, really toxic to the culture, you have to take corrective right. action as well. That's that's so important. And uh, like everything else, you have to let others be custodian of yeah. the culture. You have to be there to enable, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, others have to talk about culture as well. They have to act like that. And oftentimes people say, what is what do you mean by culture? What yeah. is culture? And I think that culture is how people act when nobody is watching, right. when nobody is telling them what mm-hmm. to do. And if you can inculcate that mindset, right. then... Um, uh, it can go a long way. Another important point I would want to make is culture shouldn't mean that you create sort of a cult hmm. where... Well, I have created cult, so... Uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> I'm talking about different okay. things. Uh, but uh, uh, all ideas are welcome. Right. Uh, it should never be that you talk about, oh, this is how we've always yeah. done things. Uh, diverse ideas, change, openness to change, all of that is extremely important. Yeah. Uh, but core values, there has to be a line. Right, right. Now, I love this idea of selfless uh, excellence. You know, I came across this quote. It's amazing what you can achieve if you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah. I think the, uh, the idea of selfless excellence, you know, goes to the heart of that. Right. And this whole thing of Ajit, you know, being deliberately designing for a culture. You realize this early on in Nutanix or early on thoughts, but when did it become a, you know, deliberate thing where you said took mental ownership that I am going to design the culture for a particular objective in a particular manner? I think it was more at ThoughtSpot because okay. I, mean, I mean, I think we built a great culture at Nutanix yeah. as well. Uh, but um, this time I was more deliberate about communicating it yeah. and, and synthesizing it into a couple of words. Right. Um, and uh, like everything else, I felt that if we don't do it, it won't scale. Right. And um, if you want to build a company that outlasts you, mm-hmm. uh, you have to ingrain that right. in the culture of the company. Yeah. And I felt that uh, rather than coming up with 10 values, big statements about right. culture, uh, it's uh, going to be much easier right. if there are two words that we use. And you can talk to anyone if you tap anyone on the shoulder mm-hmm. at ThoughtSpot and right. ask them what the culture is yeah. and describe this. And hopefully they also believe that uh, we acted. And right. it's very important. If right. leaders stop acting, yeah. then nobody's going to believe. Right. So you absolutely have to role model, you know. But beyond that, you know, did you also create any kind of artifacts in terms of either policies or rituals or a particular language, I guess selfless excellence itself is a term, is a new coined. Yeah. But just, you know, think of examples such as, you know, Amazon has, you know, bar razor or six pager, you know, document or uh, uh, or two pizza team and so on. Like this, you know, some of those things which, you know, binds the intent behind the culture into yeah. visible things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, some of those rituals which are more specific to functions, how you run, for example, your sales forecast. Right. There is a process for mm-hmm. that. How do you do product reviews? Right. There is a process for that. Mm-hmm. How do you do design workshops? Sure. There is a process for yeah. that. 
um, always writing before speaking. It, yeah. That's uh, another thing that we did um, mm -hmm. very actively. I thought, and we learned from all these right. companies. It's not like mm -hmm. uh, we have to innovate everything from yeah. scratch. Netflix, Amazon, yeah. and others, they have certain aspects that are really good. And obviously, ultimately, you're building very unique right. company, a very unique culture. You're pitching parts and pieces from other places, adding your own, making right. all of them yeah. your own. Uh, I found this uh, simple idea of a Slack channel where mm -hmm. anyone and everyone can recognize yeah. selfless excellence right. um, to be extremely powerful. Uh, because when people start talking about yeah. it, that's when it really, really becomes right. ingrained yeah. in the organization. Yeah, you know, speaking of you know, design and culture deliberately, I um, remember the one particular incident you know, from winter days. And again, we didn't invent that. We copied from somewhere. You know, I forgot. But you know, we were at some point, we were trying, we were growing very fast. And we were forgetting, you know, the who we are servicing, which is the consumer who's going to buy from online. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you know, we, um, we put up a chair in all conference room yeah, yeah. with this ribbon around the customer. Correct, correct. And then, you know, almost they were trying to talk to that person also. You know, correct. we are going to make this choice because we think this is how it's going to benefit. You know, that's correct, correct. one you know, very visible reminder to people, you know, correct, for, correct. Uh, uh, at that time, we really want to champion that you yeah. need to do yeah. customer centric it's things, right? Yeah. And yeah. so on, right? So, but I think this, you know, this, this, uh, it's something, you know, probably, again, early stage founders may not think a lot about, you know, probably more so in India that what you said that, you know, culture is probably the biggest product you are creating. Mm -hmm. And if you don't create it proactively, it will end up creating itself, you know, by everybody brings some culture with them. They're yep. used to, you know, the environment they come from Correct. and become some, you know, mashup of yep. all those, you know, miscellaneous things. Some may be good, some may not be good, some right. may be at odds with each other. Yep. So I think taking a mental ownership is, you know, super important. Probably also requires time for introspecting and reflection because in early stage startup, the you know, most important thing is you are trying to recruit some people, you know, which is not easy. You are trying to make product market fit happen. You are trying to raise money. So you have a bunch of you know very tangible tasks. Mm -hmm. How do you create this mental bandwidth to also think about the software aspects? I think um, there is no sort of mechanical answer to this yeah. to say oh, that you have to spend two hours every yeah. week to do something like this. You have to treat it as part of building the company. Yeah. It is. It either is or is not. Just like right. you have to hire, if you're building a product team, you have to hire designers, you have mm -hmm. to hire engineers, yeah. whatever. Salespeople, marketing. Similarly, you have to build culture. Right. And sometimes I see, you know, leaders put culture on HR. HR will do culture. Right. And that's so unfair. Yeah. That is so unfair. Uh, you as a founder have, or better have, yeah. the most moral authority in the organization. Right. Right. Uh, and if you are not spending time in defining, communicating, acting, scaling the culture, yeah. it's not HR's job to mm -hmm. just build culture or do people management. Yeah. HR is there to facilitate, right. uh, but uh, that's completely a missed opportunity to right. spend time on it. Um, so there, there is no one formula. Right. There are various ways people can do right. it, and everyone has their own way of sort of prioritizing things. Yeah. For me, it's always been one of the top yeah. priorities. Amazing. You built, you know, both of your company in the larger ecosystem, Silicon Valley, which, you know, is probably in the making sense, you know, depending upon how you look at it, goes all the way back to 70s or 60s or even before that, you know, Fairchild Semiconductor, early yep. days HP and so on. How much that ecosystem has shaped, you know, how you think, how you build your companies? Yeah, the ecosystem is a huge thing. And uh, I have really come to appreciate the notion of an ecosystem after I started uh, building a saltwater tank in my house, <laughs> you know, aquarium. Uh, it's the most sensitive ecosystem in the world uh, with corals and fish right. and how you get started. You know, you start with water, you have to start with specific kind of fish. You can't just put everything together. How big is the aquarium that you built? It's it's a decent size aquarium. It's not too huge. Uh, it's about 800 gallon uh, tank. It came with the house. Right. I, I, not, but... Uh, during COVID, we emptied mm -hmm. it because I don't have people. I cannot. It's like it's very complex to manage mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I was getting to was that you have to very slowly and deliberately build that ecosystem. Yeah. You have to start with uh, these fish, and then as these starts to happen, and then at some point you can add certain kind of other fish, and you can start to add some kind of corals that are going to be more hardy corals, mm -hmm. and then eventually, if you do a good enough job, where you can control so many parameters: temperature, nitrogen, ammonia. Yeah. So many things have to be monitored within very tight control limit. Mm -hmm. Then you can add certain kind of corals. So um, I've lived in Silicon Valley for the last several years, and people talk about this tech ecosystem. But I've really, really come to appreciate mm -hmm. the ecosystem. The fish you add, they shouldn't hurt the corals. Yeah, because there's on very few corals, uh, coral safe fish. 
There are certain kind of fish, if you add them young, yeah. then they become used to being around corals without damaging mm -hmm. them. If you add them more mature adult right. uh, uh, fish, then they will uh, mm -hmm. damage the corals. Um, so uh, it has had a huge impact on me. But um, I was also very fortunate to work in organizations even before that, mm -hmm. where they promoted that sort of entrepreneurship. Right. I talked about Honeywell. Yeah. And um, I had this leader that I worked with, even my boss here uh, at Honeywell, uh, Suresh. She was one of the best people I've seen uh, in building organizations, in finding the right role for the right people. Right. Um, so if you are curious, you'll keep learning always. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the valley, I just felt at home. Right. Because I had been fortunate to work with mm -hmm. leaders like that. Right. Even my uh, first boss at uh, I2 Technologies, uh, Rahul, he gave us uh, so much freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, I rem still remember, I told him that, hey, tomorrow I want to take a day off and do this. He said, don't worry, just take the day off. Right. You don't have to apply for, mm -hmm. you know, the day off. And, and because when you work late nights or yeah. you come here to work on the weekend, right. I'm not adding right. that to a register. Yeah. So that stayed with me. Right. And uh, at uh, ThoughtSpot, we have this unlimited mm -hmm. vacation policy. Right. As long as, you know, uh, you are in sync with your manager, right. uh, there is no finite uh, vacations. You know, people have to attend to their family, they right. start up their working day yeah. and night. So it, it's a both a two-way street. So a lot of this is just uh, learning over, right. over time and uh, working with the right people and that shapes you. I don't mm -hmm. think Silicon Valley is this sort of totally different place sure. where you come and you... Uh, uh, you just cannot even find pieces and parts yeah. of that culture in other places. Right. I was able to. And, and, and we are obviously seeing that, you know, happen. I mean, Israel has done an outstanding job, I think, you know, both in Bangalore and Gurgaon. I think the ecosystem has matured uh, considerably, and we'll probably talk about that in a lot more detail. But see, look, Silicon Valley continues to produce, you know, these uh, technology innovations, you know, most recently. Everything's happening with transformer technology, you know, chat GPT and BARD and so on. Yep. Um, and so on, you know, year after year, something, you know, big keeps coming out of it. Like, what do you attribute? Is it like just talent density? It just, you know. It's the ecosystem, yeah. as I was saying earlier. So in the Valley, you see very strong engineering school. Yeah. Um, you see um, inter, uh, investors. Uh, you see a lot of good talent um that are across diverse fields there are people that are you know good in design yeah with apple uh, that culture has right. spread into other places uh google created this culture of uh, building a lot of things on your own yeah and open source and very scalable system yeah. that has seeped into cloud and many other places right amazon has done really uh, amazing things when it comes to strong operational excellence yeah. in many areas right. prioritization uh writing and these kinds of things so um, uh, it, eco replicating an ecosystem is very hard and the reason right. I uh, talked at length about the the tank uh, that it is very very hard to build mm. and it's also very easy to lose recently mm. actually I had an accident where there was some uh, toxic uh, something toxic that got uh, introduced mm -hmm. uh, into the tank I don't know what it was and yeah. it had a lot of impact on the mm. uh, species uh, right. in the tank so uh, for leaders that are involved in building ecosystem, yeah. people like you mm -hmm. that have done um, companies here uh, in India, and now uh, you are doing broader things in in uh, in a big way. You are impacting the ecosystem that is getting built here. Um, I think uh, once you build the ecosystem, yeah. that is when the real beauty sure. uh, comes out. Right. You know, this tank with the, all these corals and colors and fish. It is. Yeah. It is. I just look at it, and it's so meditative. Right. Uh, for ten minutes, I can just stare at. Uh, any one thing there, right? So uh, it's it's very very difficult to build these ecosystems, yeah. and they also provide the moat. You know, a lot right. of people for the longest time yeah. have been throwing stones at uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, and of course there is going to be ups and downs, mm -hmm. but it is very very hard to right uh, replicate those. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think I'm obviously super excited about you know emergence of the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem in India, and I think is going from strength to strength. Yeah, but I think. The Silicon Valley ecosystem also has very strong vote. I think that, you know, last four or five decades of history. And one, you know, I mean, there's obviously a talent density. In fact, on talent density, I want to ask you, you know, since, you know, both of us are obviously of Indian origin, you know, this dominance of Indian origin founders in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Again, that just, just talent density is just, you know, all of us had, had role models and friends, so we all end up there and yeah. so on. Is there anything more to it? Is there anything about the education system in India or mindset yeah, of thinking? Yeah, or Yeah, sure. I mean, look, this has been talked at length, uh, so people know all of this, that um, uh, 
people that end up in Silicon Valley, a large portion of them come from good engineering schools uh, in India. And it's uh, it's not easy because so many people in the country and going through, uh, coming from middle class families, a yeah. uh, lot of good work ethic. Yeah. Or your work ethic is the only thing that can actually even help you get there. Yeah. And uh, that work ethic combined with this sort of, uh, you know, feeling that there's nothing to lose. Yeah. I came from a place where we had, you know, decent food and education, but there was uh, not any big cushion yeah. uh, around you. Uh, if you have that mentality, mm -hmm. that and and you get there, yeah. you see that passion in people, um, and uh, they can build great companies. Right. Um, I don't think there is anything more to it. There is mm -hmm. nothing fundamentally different. Uh, there is good talent everywhere, and uh, a lot of that talent through osmosis has also spread into many mm -hmm. other places. There's a lot of people from Silicon Valley that have come back to right. uh, the area like you, mm -hmm. you know, investors who have come back yeah. uh, and are doing great things here. Um, COVID definitely helped mm -hmm. spread that out uh, yeah. a little bit more, even in US. This is like Austin are now thriving. Right. And I think that's good for the tech industry, mm -hmm. just being concentrated in one place. Yeah. Uh, before COVID, I'd seen it had become mm -hmm. really unhealthy level of demand supply gap mm -hmm. uh, for talent and for anything. Yeah. It took pay a lot and sometimes you may not uh, even get the right people for the role. Yeah. So I'm really glad that uh, talent is spreading everywhere. Um, and uh, opportunity is also mm -hmm. now starting to uh, come up. Right. And Ajit, you heard, I think both of your previous companies, you guys have had development center in Bangalore. And I'm assuming a meaningful portion of your engineering team was probably based out of Bangalore. Yeah. How yeah. have you seen that, you know, ecosystem evolve? Were you able to find equal caliber engineers? Were you able to do same kind of work in both Silicon Valley and Bangalore, you know, last, you know, let's say last decade or so? No, certainly. So, you know, Nutanix has had a, a big team uh, in Bangalore for a while. Uh, Thoughtspot also now in India, we have roughly 400 uh, people uh, globally in R&D and mm -hmm. 300 are in India. Okay. So we actually in India have three locations now. Mm -hmm. Bangalore uh, is where we started. Yeah, uh, we built it uh, from uh, scratch. Uh, there is a guy called Puneet Puneet Agarwal. He was really amazing. He had come from uh, the Bay Area, Stanford, mm -hmm. Google. Yeah, came back here. So people like that, right? Who've seen both sides, and they made for great, you know, first time leaders. Yeah, um, to start new locations, and uh, we were very clear that we actually had a no HQ culture at Thought mm -hmm. I hated the term HQ. Yeah. Because that sounds like there's this place where all the important right. stuff happens yeah. and everybody else is just there to follow orders. I, I hated that because I had been in Bangalore yeah. and uh, being in Bangalore, you're working with teams that yeah. are global. And I, I sometimes felt that, you know, we want to have an equal seat right. around the table. So um, we said uh, in Bangalore, we will start with teams that are fully uh, staffed yeah. and uh, PMs designers and engineers. Sometimes you'll see product managers sit in, yeah. in the US and here you have software development or sometimes even bug fixing and QA and all. Uh, but we said, no, every uh, location will be a first class citizen. We'll do complete work. Mm -hmm. We have to do a good job to uh, chunk up the work in the yeah. right way so that uh, you can create autonomy. So I believe in this idea of autonomy with alignment. Yeah. So if you can do that, then you can create highly empowered team. Mm -hmm. And you also get to attract better talent. Right. Because if you're hiring engineers here and they know that the PMs and designers will yeah. sit right here and I can do this thing completely, uh, magic happens. So now um, we are doing, there is no part of the product where Bangalore is actually not center of gravity anymore. Mm -hmm. A lot of good work. Bang when I, sorry, when I say Bangalore, uh, we started with Bangalore. I didn't complete that part. Then we acquired a company called Diota in Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. It's about 50 people at yeah. the time. Now it's more than 100 people. Right. And last year, we also started a new location in Sivandram. And mm -hmm. we have about 25, 30 people uh, there. Yeah. And uh, um, I think it's very important to know that you have to invest in yeah. time and energy. And you have to start with the right leader. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, if you don't start with the right leader, if you hire a few uh, junior people, or people that are more ICs, and yeah. then you're trying to manage them from US or any other location. I don't think it's about US versus India. Mm -hmm. There is a company in one location you want to start. Um, you have to start with the leader. Right. And that has really worked well. In each of these new locations, we always started with the leaders. Someone from Hyderabad actually left to start this mm -hmm. uh, new center in uh, Trivandrum and right. it's uh, working very well. And Do you think you know pretty much any kind of development work can happen in India or the areas where skill gaps are there and we need to do better job of you know building those skill gap and, and you know mentorship around those those areas. 
Um, I think though we've done, you know, UI work, we've done uh, AI work out of uh, Bangalore at ThoughtSpot, we've done database work, database kernel work. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, there may be some very arcane areas where yeah. Uh, there is still that sort of gap. Right. Uh, for example, uh, OpenAI and BARD and some of these yeah. things are happening more right now in the US. Right. Um, it remains to be seen how many of those kinds of companies and organizations you really, really need mm -hmm. over time. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of great machine learning talent mm -hmm. here that can transition to this yeah. new world of uh, LLMs. Right. And the same thing is happening in US as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's become a very level playing yeah. field now. I don't think there is any uh, difference at all. And uh, if I can spend a minute on how I have seen the India uh, talent mm -hmm. um, uh, ev uh, profile evolve over time, um, that will be uh, that could be useful. Yeah. So I was here till two thousand six. Right. As we were saying, that's when you were coming. Yeah. I was moving there, and uh, at the time uh, you had a lot of these services companies, yeah. uh, or you had. Very large organizations like Oracle, mm -hmm. uh, IBM, uh, that were doing some tech work yeah. uh, in India. I was very lucky that I too, they decided to move um, all of their product development to India. Mm -hmm. It was out of necessity because the bubble had burst, right. they had to cut costs, yeah. so everything was happening. But the, those were very, very few opportunities. Mm -hmm. Most of the work was services or product yeah. uh, maintenance. Mm -hmm. But then... You came here, yeah. and you then showed people that you can actually do B two C companies mm -hmm. right. uh, with a successful exit uh, in India. Yeah. So Mintra, uh, Flipkart, and, and several others. And last five to seven years, there are very meaningful B two B SaaS companies mm -hmm. that have been coming out of India. Right. So of course, people know about Freshworks and Loco. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very fortunate that a lot of entrepreneurs reach out to us, and they want to talk about how to grow their business. These mm -hmm. are SaaS entrepreneurs yeah. from India that have got into, say, $10 million in the right. hour, and they want to uh, learn how to get to 50, yeah. 100, and so forth. So they, they reach out, and I always am happy to uh, share my experience with uh, uh, any entrepreneur. But in the process, I have actually learned a lot more from right. them. I have seen the way they are doing product development of in, out of India, that's uh, obviously a given. But even when it comes to sales and marketing, yeah. they have done some very, very interesting things. Mm -hmm. And as they say, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Yeah. Uh, I know a small company called Hero Data. Actually, I met with the founder mm -hmm. yesterday. Uh, he's done such an amazing job of SEO, yeah, content marketing and SEO, that he gets, I think, more than a million visitors to his website right. every every month. Amazing. And I had our ThoughtSpot CMO mm -hmm. talk to him to learn right. from him. Great. So I, I, I think that on SaaS entrepreneurs right. from India that are trying to build products that are yeah. global, they should not underestimate right. themselves. Uh, they have some unique advantages. Right. I know of companies here that are now landing million plus dollar accounts mm -hmm. in the US, right. sitting from here. Of course, they have a few people yeah. in the US for very specific roles, but bulk of teams are here. Right. So if I were ever to think about another company, yeah. I, I'm going to do even more uh, out of India. And uh, I really want people from India to know that uh, they are as capable as anyone mm -hmm. else. And I encourage them to look at global customers from day one. Yeah. Because the flip side is, if they think that it's going to be very hard to do yeah. it, and they never do it, I also know of companies uh, which are very good, but they are stuck at this 20 million, 30 million mm -hmm. in ARR, selling to only um, India customers, right. or maybe you know Middle East, uh, APAC customers, mm -hmm. and not thinking big, thinking yeah. global. So if you zoom out and look at in you know, the next you know, decade, do you think there are a lot of, potential opportunities out of India to go after this global SaaS market. And the reason I ask is there have been, you know, plenty of funding that's gone into this space last five to seven years. There are probably thousands of startups, you know, in the broader SaaS space, you know, mm -hmm. going after various verticals yep. and industries and use case and so on. We have this very successful conference, SaaS Boomi. Yep. I don't know if you attend that or not. I have not but, attended, but I've heard of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, with, you know, so much that has already in some has gone in, but there is also, you know, uh, I mean, um, challenge of, you know, you have your based out of here, but ultimately, you know, you have to sell to an enterprise and at cert beyond certain scale, you have to cultivate those relationships and mm -hmm. figure out a way to, you know, get an entry into the organization. Yeah. So how sure. to, how should one think about, you know, building a large scale SaaS yeah. company out of India? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think, uh, Indian entrepreneurs have an inherent advantage because the, the, uh, the velocity with which they can do things yeah. from here, it's very hard to do out mm -hmm. of the U.S. Uh, and even enterprise buying and selling has changed in the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, if you think about a startup 
or any tech company 15, 20 years ago, yeah. who had these very capable salespeople that were whining and dining with, you know, CIOs yeah. from large companies playing golf and so on. Right. And that's, it was all Rolodex based. Yeah. Selling. That has completely changed mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, decade. Yeah. And now with product led growth, people can test, try your technology mm -hmm. from anywhere. Yeah. And uh, more and more companies are being built up in this uh, ground up way right. where you start with either SMBs or mid market and then you go to enterprise because that gives you the advantage of iterating uh, on the product uh, very fast. The thing though is that if you don't uh, have a few enterprise customers from the early days, you might miss out on key features, mm -hmm. uh, which are more related to operational robustness of right. your offering, your security, availability, scalability, those kinds of things mm -hmm. that can become a bottleneck uh, for you to sell to large enterprises. Right. So if you can be mindful about mm -hmm. that, I don't think there is any um, a disadvantage at all. And you can always have, if it is a multi-co-founder team, mm -hmm. I'm seeing uh, oftentimes there will be one co-founder who is in US, there is one or two here. Right. Uh, I think that is important. Just hiring, some people think that I can just hire a salesperson in right. US yeah. and I can stay here. That model does not really work right. well. And with all kinds of visas now available right. and the mobility between the countries has yeah. become easier as well. People should take advantage of it. Yeah. But if they have ambition to mm -hmm. build a global business, there is nothing that can hold them back. It's only their own thinking that could hold them back. That's very encouraging to hear it. I mean, I think from what I understand, I think global IT industries. No, I mean, numbers may always, obviously a multi trillion dollars. I will not venture a number. IT services export out of India is about $200 billion. Mm -hmm. But the, I think SaaS revenue for the company based around India is probably in the 10 to $15 billion range. So it's still fairly minuscule in the larger scheme of things. Sure. But if India can you go take that number from, you know, 10 plus to 100 plus, you know, which probably should be doable in the next 10 to 15 years. And that, then in terms of the value creation of the revenue yeah. is, you know, yeah. Quite sure, definitely, yeah. There is Indian uh, businesses themselves as consumers of SaaS right. um, uh, technology. Uh, the, that part is growing. But I'm saying that even today, you don't have to wait for that yeah. to happen. Even today, you can do that. And, uh, you know, I sometimes invest in some companies. Um, and if I invest in a company that started by Indian entrepreneurs in, uh, in the Valley or US, mm -hmm. you can talk to many of them. They're sick of me hearing that <laughs> they should go start a team in India yeah. as soon as they start a company. Right. And, Sometimes they don't get it. Right. So there is the inverse problem as well, right. where people in US are still not realizing the potential yeah. of what uh, India can do. And uh, I think it's it's a lost opportunity for them. So if you ever start something, you're going to start with the India team first. Certainly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, both both places. So Ajit, last you know five six months, you know the dialogue around AI has reached this fever pitch. You know everybody, you know their mom and dog, everyone is talking about you know yep. how AI is going to completely change the world. But looking from my entrepreneurial lens, people who are starting to looking to start a company, how should they think about it? You know, what does emergence of AI and the you know probably shortening of a lot of creation kind of work, you know, where a lot of what you can do as a human being can be augmented by AI. Mm -hmm. So what's your mental model of, you know, or your advice for uh, you know entrepreneurs to, you know, understand that and leverage that in as they think about building companies? Sure, sure. I you know, I often think about paradoxes of uh, the paradoxes that uh, entrepreneurs have to deal with and need to be conscious of. Uh, whenever there is a hype like this, on one hand, if you are not tuned in, yeah. then you uh, may actually miss out on an opportunity to leverage something new. Yeah. On the other hand, if you are tuned too much, mm -hmm. tuned in too much, then uh, that just consumes you and a lot of your ideation might be uh, yeah. unfairly driven by that. So um, my view is that uh, everyone should be aware and should be knowledgeable about it. Uh, but we also know that, you know, as as a society, uh, with news traveling so fast, technology becoming yeah. so accessible, and you're right, technology like ChatGPT. My admin was telling me the other day how she's using ChatGPT right. to get a lot of answers very quickly, yeah. as opposed to going to Google and going through 20 different right. links to understand something. Uh, so it is for real. But uh, I really think that unless you want to build AI infrastructure where you want to uh, enable, say, enterprises to use LLMs or in a particular sector, medical uh, um, uh, area, you want to uh, build some purpose-built uh, AI technology. People should focus on identifying the markets and the problems mm -hmm. before they think about using AI or machine learning or any other technology. Yeah. Because all of these are means to an end, yeah. end of the day. And um, uh, the challenge in this kind of environment is to find what I like to call as durable problems. Mm -hmm problem that you're trying to solve today, if you're starting a company, it has to be relevant at least for 10 years. Right. 
hopefully for much longer because it takes 10 years to build anything meaningful. Right. And uh, if you just try to get excited about uh, AI yeah. and uh, you will be able to raise money because that's the other thing that is going on right now. While people are talking about this funding winter, yeah. you also see some you know, big rounds being yeah. done for companies that are working on AI or leveraging AI yeah. in some way. So you'll be able to raise money. But in a year's time, that might become totally commoditized yeah. and you'll be out of luck. So my encouragement to everyone would be to, uh, um, of course, learn, uh, be curious, experiment uh, with it, uh, but uh, look for durable problems. Mm -hmm. Don't uh, think about AI first. Um, I really think that 2023, the whole world is in a big hackathon. Yeah. <laughs> that is what all of us are doing right. with, with the, all this new yeah. capability that we really don't know. Right what will work, yeah. uh, what will be durable, uh, how eventually things will pan out, where will more value get created, uh, how many companies will build their own LLMs mm -hmm. or will there be a few that will be providers. Mm -hmm. All of these things are right. uh, still up in the air. So let's keep an open mind, let's keep experimenting and learning, but uh, just focus on the market and the problem. This idea of you know, durable problems reminds me of this mental model. I think you know, it's a, Bezos has talked about this as you can talk about things that are going to change in 5 to 10 years, but also focus on things that are not going to change in 10 years. Yeah. Because if you're clear about that, Correct. then you know you have some stability about future mm -hmm. and you can then bet on that yeah. without worrying about the market or the yeah. hype. You know, To your point about you know, all the funding they're going to generate away now, yeah. three years ago, all of that was going into you know crypto, you know, and where are those companies, right? You know, very yeah. little mm -hmm. durable stuff has come out of you know all that hype. You know, right. uh, crazy amount of funding has gone in. But it's coming back to AI. So there, you have this, you know, open AI platform, you can build, you know, some use cases on top of that. Yeah. But as somebody who's looking to leverage AI, what are the you know, one level below? What do they work with? You know, are there going to be a lot of these frameworks and platforms that all this big tech is going to come up in the next, you know, I don't know, few months or few years? Like, how does one actually work on it, you know, beyond all these, you know, just very superficial use cases you can build on chat Yeah, technology. yeah. You know, I think, you know, you can create demoware very, very quickly yeah. now. Right. Uh, but, um, uh, what is sustainable is is TBD, yeah. honestly, because there's talks of you know Nvidia doing their own services as well. They're acquiring companies. Uh -huh. Google is doing a lot of stuff. Microsoft obviously is happily yeah. investing in this. There are startups that are being funded. So we just don't know how that is going to pan out in terms of the ecosystem, how it evolves, what is available as a service, what will happen outside, what will happen inside. Um, but um, the the best way people can really work through this is to do two things. One, core experimentation. So experiment yeah. the hell out of it, right? Mm -hmm. Let your teams just play with it a lot and yeah. try different use cases. Make sure you're plugged into customers right. so that whatever you're doing, it solves meaningful problems mm -hmm. uh, for them. Uh, but then you have to also eventually build the right kind of abstraction. Yeah. For example, in ThoughtSpot context, uh, we have launched <clears throat> new search that is uh, uh, leveraging the 10 year of research that we have done mm -hmm. combined with uh, the public services that are now available. But uh, the unique problem we are trying to solve is that every customer that we sell to, they have their own data. Yeah. They are in different domains. They don't even have a common data model. Right. So we, if we just take off the shelf AI that is available yeah. and start using it, it's very hard to predict mm -hmm. the quality of result. Right. It won't be very good. So there's a lot of focus in making it more predictable, making the user experience more robust. Yeah. And it is a non-trivial problem. Right. We have a really, really strong team mm -hmm. uh, with the deep uh, AI and machine learning capabilities. Uh, but there is a lot of problems we are uncovering mm -hmm. as we solve. I think that is a great thing mm -hmm. because I would have been very scared yeah. uh, for the company right. if it all just worked magically right. out of the box. That's right. Right. And so many people reached out to me. Hey, you guys have been doing search. Uh, now we have open AI. What happens to thoughts about mm -hmm. now? And it's very clear that it is uh, actually giving us so much impetus to move forward on our mission, which right. we talk about as making the world more fact-driven so people can access facts very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some very serious problems that still have to be solved, which combine the trifecta that we have always believed yeah. in, user experience, algorithms, and systems. Right. So um, I think that uh, people that are trying to build meaningful companies, mm -hmm. if they are focused on the right problems, yeah. I don't think they have to be worried that what they're building uh, could be relevant. And when you know when people talk about um, creating their own custom LLM for a particular domain, how easy or difficult it is, and what does it take? Like for example, let's say in cult, I don't know we want to create a fitness LLM mm -hmm. or health LLM, so that yeah. I can ask it any question about health, 
how should one do? I think at best you need to do a little bit of fine tuning. I don't think building a new LLM from scratch today mm -hmm. has a lot of because uh, ChatGPT already consume whatever is available, but yeah. not private data. So there is private data that will get solved. Uh, there is cost that will get solved. I am not sure if mm -hmm. there will be a need for every company yeah. or even hundreds of companies mm -hmm. to build their own LLM. Right. Um, I think um, what will be valuable is for people to uh, figure out the right user experience, the right way to leverage these services and build stuff around yeah. that. And when you're building, you, you think about it, like eventually then you, there are five services, they're constantly changing. Yeah. You're building your software on top of that. Right. Um, you want to um, work with partners where technology will keep uh, improving very, very fast, unless you want to be in that business yourself. Right. Yeah. If that's not your area of strength, then what's the point? As long as you get the right economics, yeah. the right control, mm -hmm. because enterprise customers, rightly so, right now worried about data privacy and all that. Right. But I think that's a matter of time. It's true for anything like you know computers or, mm -hmm. or networks. Yeah. When networks first came about and email happened, you know, right. people were worried that you know yeah. oh, should I send this email or not because this is data; it could go anywhere. Right. What are you currently learning? Oh, uh, as you know, I'm learning about healthcare and you uh, sort of, unknowingly, you don't know this, but you become my teacher in that area. Oh, <laughs> I was wondering, you know, I, I've i been, you know, meeting you last few months and every time I meet you with the internet talking about, you know, startups or Silicon Valley or new idea and you end up talking about health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm learning a lot about health. Actually, um, look, Alok, I've had an interest in um, health for a very long time. Uh, in fact, uh, my original plan when I was doing my undergrad, I worked with a professor on a project which was at the intersection of chemical engineering and medical science. Mm -hmm. My undergrad was chemical engineering. So I was very passionate about that. Yeah. I was going to go do a PhD in that area. Yeah. But my dad was not well, so I decided to stay back in India and MBA and all that. So we talked about my, my right. experience. Uh, but uh, over time, also, I've had very close relatives that have been impacted by you know serious uh, diseases like cancer and passed away and so forth. So I developed an interest in just yeah. reading about that. Um, last uh, five to seven years, I've, I've uh, read a few things. I've invested in startups in this area, uh, but um, as uh, you know, as we are all getting older, I'm just learning more about my uh, my own health mm -hmm. and my family's health, and uh, that is driving a lot of curiosity. And I'm really curious how uh, technology can actually solve uh, a lot of problems in uh, health science, life science. Yeah. You know, healthcare. There is the operational aspect of healthcare, which right. also I'm curious about, and. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have some uh, friends in the U.S., uh, specifically uh, General Catalyst, Tim and Taneja, who's done a lot of work in this area. I'm learning from them mm -hmm. on about health systems and right. how they operate and what the challenges are. Uh, but when it comes to life sciences, um, health, fitness, um, the, as you know this much, much better than me. There is there is so much uh, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. So much we don't know yet. Right. And the economics are not set up to actually... Uh, build systems that uh, enable uh, a very more holistic approach. Yeah. The economics today are set up for pharma companies to come out with new molecules, yeah. do trials, and then launch big drugs. Right. But there is so much more uh, that has shaped our uh, right. body that um, goes beyond uh, drugs. So that's an area I'm really fascinated okay. by. I'm really glad to hear. And in health, you know, there is one can approach from personal health point of view, and you know, there's a lot of optimization one can do. There is a lot of things happening in the health, you know, from sciences and technology point of view. But again, you're putting an entrepreneurial head. How relevant, in your opinion, you know, the focus on health, fitness, mental health, etc., you know, from anyone, you know, who's looking to start a company. You mean entrepreneurs looking to start a Both company? Both or, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, for, no, I meant, you know, just for, you know, attention and investment in your own health. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. So, look, the there is... Uh, no free lunch and uh, one of the, a couple of things that get really compromised when you are on an entrepreneurial journey which don't have to be if you're conscious one is family second is health yeah because you know we get consumed by the problems we are mm -hmm. trying to solve and you know that's why you want to do it uh but i've learned over time that um, i actually didn't do as good a job as i i should have uh spending time uh with my kids when they were very young uh -huh. um, at least uh, my first kid when i was playing uh nutanix and then early days of thought spot i was not spending as much time as i should have uh but last um, five to seven years i've become a lot more conscious uh -huh. and i'm spending more time with both yeah. my kids now uh same thing goes for health as well we take right. it for granted until you're 40 you know the system works pretty well yeah. you can push it to the limits uh but then things start to fall apart 
um and the um, I was listening to um, uh, Keith Raboy. Uh, he's an investor in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, has done really well. Yeah. Um, one of his bosses told him um, to make sure that he's finding time for um, for fitness mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. And uh, that that uh, that made sense to me. So right. while uh, doing all of these things uh, is important, if you don't take care of family and health, yeah. then in the long run you will have regret. Right. And what is important to notice i've noticed i've realized that early days i'd work whatever i never counted hours but i maybe spending 80 hours working yeah from 75 to 80 i don't think it really had a material impact right. uh, on the on the outcome yeah. or whatever so basically the incremental value you get right. from uh, investing more into work right. versus family and health yeah uh, there is the trade off is very clear to me. Right. In fact, you know, my point of view is that I think beyond a certain hours, you know, start to even sometimes become diminishing returns. Yep. Because you are negative returns. Return. Negative returns, yep. right? Because you're in their echo chamber, you are not allowing yourself, you know, freedom to step back, yep. zoom out, yep. and let you know brains make the connection, you know, yep. instead of you know just bogged down with the details yep. continuously. Yep. So yep. My mental model is I think fifty to sixty hours of very high quality, you can yep. pretty much do whatever anyone wants to right. do. And I think the reason. It's great, you know, we're talking about health, you know, in the context of entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship is a very long-term game. Yep. For you, it's been, you know, over a decade now building, you know, ThoughtSpot and therefore companies may probably multi-decade journey ahead of itself. Right. So to find that stamina, you know, unless you're in a foundation, yep. Yep. You, know, you know, family, health, you know, your just mental sharpness, you know, not yep. on the, you can't, you know, place. Not family. getting lost in details, you know, yeah. keeping the big picture in mind and mental health as well. And we talked about earlier how you have to have people that you can be open with right. inside the organization and outside, good mentors, good advisors, good friends. All of that is very important. A few things that I've done over time is, uh, this uh, habit actually stopped during COVID, but I was doing solo offsite. So sometimes mm -hmm. I would just go somewhere for yep. a couple of days and uh, and and uh, I think about the big picture. If I'm not able to do that, then typically Sunday evening, I'll spend an hour or two yep. uh, just abstracting away from the details and yep. thinking about you know the big picture. Right. I think solo offside is a great idea. I'm honestly trying to incorporate in my lifestyle, not able to do it successfully. Yeah. But I'm determined, I think, sooner or later, I'll, I'll definitely do it, even if it is, you know, starting with one or two days. Ajit, let's zoom out. You know, let's say we live in very interesting times, you know. Um, things are continuing to accelerate. You know, technology is continuing to transform how individuals and companies and societies and, you know, countries work, right? If you were to zoom out and take in the next, you know, one or two decade picture, you know, what are the just big thematic things you are personally, you know, very excited about? You know, what do you anticipate? You know, going to just go to a yeah, it's, it's it's very hard to predict ten to twenty years right. out, right? Uh, and there is enough people, more qualified futurists, who do it for a living and they probably have a better point of view. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the area that I am most excited about actually is health. Yeah, I think uh, in other areas as well, communication. Um, enterprise software, there will be significant improvements and productivity will increase substantially. Uh, but when it comes to uh, health outcomes, yeah, uh, I think we are going to see magical improvements in the next 10 years. And uh, I, 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 I sincerely hope and believe that they will percolate across all strata of society, mm -hmm. not just you know the people in the highest yeah. bracket that have access to um, best technologies um, and advice um, because um, uh, health is getting digitized. Yeah. We have more data about um, our, you know, genetic makeup, our day-to-day -day, um, uh, metrics. Uh, we are getting more data about our sleep, mm -hmm. yeah. our uh, glucose levels right. and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of improvements in mm -hmm. capturing data and coming from a, a, a company that uh, works in the data space and I've seen what data can do. It can have both uh, behavioral uh, changes in people yeah. are becoming more conscious of their health. Yeah. Uh, and for people that are working in drug discovery or diagnostics to be able to innovate yeah. in those areas. I think we will see a much, much, much larger um, innovations in this area. So I, I highly encourage entrepreneurs to look at mm -hmm. um, life sciences and healthcare as an area yeah. where there are going to be really large opportunities. Right. Obviously, you have to have passion for it and someone in the team who understands this. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm super excited about what can happen in this space. I'm totally with you. I think we are at the cusp of, you know, health revolution. You know, human body at the end of the day is extremely complicated. Yep. And, and an ecosystem, you know, extremely fine-tuned fine -tuned ecosystem. But we are starting to understand more and more about how things work. You know, what are the principles and so on. And you're also 
able to you know develop technology you know all the way to gene editing and so on right you know which is probably in a matter of time can become mainstream and can be applied to solutions and that can be available to pretty much everyone irrespective of income level so i think definitely there's no question that you know we'll see a, a dramatic change you know happen in that area i would also just one last question about india you know there is so much excitement around india around the globe you know in india we talk about you know people say you know, it's going to be india century you know we'll see the rise of india as the you know next superpower in the world we'll go from 3 trillion dollar economy to 20 trillion dollar economy over the next 2 to 1/2 decades mm-hmm. how does it appear to you sitting out of silicon valley i know you spent a lot of time here as well mm-hmm. but you know you know being from india and both of us went to you know silicon valley in the time when you know it was harder to do things in india not anymore so how does this you know emerging narrative about this being india century you know, appear from distance yeah i i i believe in it uh, and obviously i'm going to be biased being from right. uh, india and uh, our friend nilkant is probably much more qualified to talk about what happens uh, here in uh, the next 10 to 15 years but uh, no i i i'm i'm a huge believer uh, and uh, indian economy itself growing um, much faster than many other places and uh, i think a lot of it also comes down to extraneous factors i do think that um, you know with the geopolitical changes that are happening around the world there is a little bit of a tailwind that is behind the growth that can occur um in india um but also how india can actually globally uh, have an impact on other countries yeah uh, it is going to be a significant change um across uh, all sectors whether it is manufacturing is uh, always the lifeblood of any economy right. and long term we have seen in us over time manufacturing went away and yeah. became very services heavy uh but now manufacturing is coming back mm-hmm. and india has the opportunity to go to the next level right and the recent uh, announcements around semiconductor manufacturing mm-hmm. is very very encouraging yeah. uh it seems that there is a good um political um interest and ability uh, to make the right changes and uh, the world is looking for you know the next uh, location where big things can be done and india is open so i'm i'm super uh, optimistic and uh, I'm excited about what can happen inside india and how india can have a global impact amazing i share your optimism about india and like i'm like yourself you know big believer in that lot of exciting things are happening in manufacturing and i think it's probably going to huge growth driver over next you know 10 to 20 years but ajit i want to just you know just just thank you for you know taking this time and having this you know very patient conversation i think you have done amazing things in life you know building two multi billion dollar companies no joke but you talk about in a very logical thoughtful grounded manner i think is very inspirational to see you know both your journey and i know i think you have probably lot more gas uh, left in the tank to do you know, some amazing things in future so uh, i learned some you know new concept new principles about your way of thinking about building startups i'm pretty sure you know listeners who listen to this podcast will find those tools useful and uh, i really want to just thank you and wish you all the best Thank you Mukesh it was a lot of fun to uh, talk together you know we are friends outside of this yeah. but uh, doing this kind of a talk for the first time it was a lot of fun thank you for the opportunity thanks at sparks we aim to bring to you stories of exponential impact we share in depth analysis of what goes behind success stories if you find our conversations interesting you can join us by subscribing to our youtube channel You can also listen to Sparks on Spotify, Apple Podcast or any other audio platform of your choice. If you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve and keep getting better as we go along.